Illuda Pioneer presents Small Batch Science, Episode 3. Hi, I'm Andy, and in this episode we're going to continue talking about the Pleistocene ivory tools of North America. Uh, the vast majority have been found here in Florida because of the superior preservation underwater in a lot of the um, rivers of North and Central Florida. But a handful of items have been found, uh, like I say, across the country um, at, at Blackwater Draw, Clovis, New Mexico, and, and a few other places, a couple in Texas and, and others here and there. Uh, outside of Florida, mostly in Clovis and pre-Clovis settings, we'll find uh, bone tools rather than ivory for heaven knows why. Uh, what I wanted to talk about here is sort of two different prongs of, of the kinds of research that go into looking at these things, both behavioral aspects and what we can learn from them about the people that made and used these things, and then I'll finish with a, a brief, very high-level overview of the kinds of things we can learn molecularly, both uh, chemistry and genetically from, from the tools themselves, because they're from an animal that's been gone for at least 13,000 years old. One of my favorites came from Sloth Hole in the Osceola River. It was uh, Ivory Point. The real ones complete my casts. I've had a couple keep breaking. Um, it's a foot long, and the two pieces were found about five years apart by the Ohms family and mended perfectly. The really interesting aspect, where the look points, is in one motion, somebody took a very sharp little stone flake and went up and down on both sides, actually, 28 times. Is it a lunar month? I don't know. It's very strange. It could just be that's how far somebody's hand reached before they had to lift up. Uh, very strange that it's the same on both sides. Maybe it represents something, but if it does, I don't know that we could demonstrate that at this point. Another ivory po um, point fragment has uh, what we've colloquially called uh, tally marks on either side of the haft element as well. I'm not sure if it's just notches on their battle addle or, or on their dart or, or what it represents, but again, a real interesting and inscrutable uh, behavioral piece of information. I showed this in the episode two. It's the largest diameter uh, ivory tool we know of in North America until last year when the new piece was found that's actually bigger and more robust and almost certainly not designed to be launched or thrown through the air, that it's a handheld thrusting weapon. In this case, what's particularly interesting here is that the haft element is recessed. It's smaller in diameter than the shaft immediately up above it, suggesting or showing one of the very few pieces of direct evidence of hafting of Clovis Age weaponry. Basically, when they had this lashed down with sinew or cordage and then probably covered with pitch and burnished, it was seamless. It was a very, very elegant way of solving the haft problem and making it uh, not be, be an obstruction as part of the weapon. Uh, a very, very interesting thing. Um, thus far in Florida, we've only been able to date one directly of these ivory tools. This one came out at 11,050 plus or minus 50, which in ca calendar years we now realize is probably almost right at 13,000 years ago. So we were really quite excited about that. Of course, I only have a picture of it now because only about that much of it still exists at the Florida Museum because uh, we burned it to find something very important out, though, of course. I'm getting rained on here a little bit, so I'm going to put them aside. Because these are teeth, and essentially the outer level of a tusk can be cementum, the, the enamel doesn't exist on these teeth, um, and the inner bulk of the tusk, and normally on a mammoth or mastodon, they can be, you know, say, eight inches in diameter, um, almost all of it is dented. It grows in a very particular fashion, though, and there's a big, giant pulp cavity back in the skull of the mastodon out into the first couple feet of the tusk. So the first third to half of the tusk is, in fact, got a big root canal in it. Imagine, if you will, a stack of cups, and that roughly every two weeks, a, a very thin, a thinner than a sheet of paper layer is, is growing inside and slowly but surely pass, pushing out in the front of the animal. Well, eventually, the dense part is the bottoms of the cups all squished together and you end up with many feet of that out in front. And that becomes really important because the way they grow in both matter, modern African, Asian, and prehistoric, all the different varieties of mammoths, or I think all the varieties of mammoths, I'd have to confess I'd need to look into that, and mastodon. 
modern elephant, mammoth, mastodon are all different. The, the physical properties actually under the microscope look a little different. And so on the handful of them that we've actually sectioned, this is just a break in a plastic cast, but when you um, have one of these little tool fragments and, and, and it's been uh, cut where, where there's an already naturally occurring break and polished and looked at under the microscope, so far eight out of eight that we've identified are mastodon, not mammoth in Florida. We have both at the time these people are here, but uh, for whatever reason, they, so far the preference is uh, mastodon. There's probably 150 of, of this kind of tool known, not only a handful complete, but fragments of about 150 are represented. So eventually, it's a destructive tusk, so we don't really want to do that to every one of them, but as many as we can you know, reasonably find that out about it's an important thing to do. So I mentioned dating. 20 years ago, we would have needed to, you know, use a third or a quarter of this piece just to get a date. Today, we can get only not only a date from a tiny little drilled hole, like this is a, a real one that, that a very kind collector in Texas gave me from probably the Ocella. We think it's North Florida somewhere, but probably Ocella. And you can see we drilled some holes in it. One of those little holes now we can get a date from. Another one, we can go after the ancient DNA of the animal and not just from the morphology determine if it's a mammoth or a mastodon, but actually genetically try and determine if it's a mammoth or a mastodon and who in the rest of the world of mammoth and mastodons it might be related to. What other populations? Is it a Florida mastodon or did that come from somewhere else? Another independent line of evidence to get at using um, another one of those drilled holes are the stable isotopes. In particular, my interest is focused on uh, strontium. So, I grew up in Minnesota. If you drilled my teeth, you could tell that as a kid, I didn't live in Florida. And in fact, if you knew, and you can test and, and figure out the, the groundwater signature from Minnesota, you could tell that I grew up in Minnesota and moved here, you know, halfway through my life at this point. Well, it works for all animals and all mammals that you can um, determine from their teeth where the water they were drinking came from. And one of the interesting things we've learned about some of the mastodons here in Florida is that in fact in the winter, probably in January when they're probably hurting for water, they leave north and central Florida and were many of them going up as far as Atlanta. So if we were to find an ivory tool in Florida but from a Georgia mastodon, that actually would make behavioral sense that we probably couldn't distinguish between was it the Paleo-Indian person's behavior, or is it the natural biography or, or biogeography of the mastodon? And so, if we found a Georgia mammoth, eh, we got a sporting chance of understanding that, in fact, it wasn't from here, that, it, that, that a person probably went and found that or had acquired the mammoth ivory and made a tool from it elsewhere. There's a lot of other ones. Um, I'll probably need to just revisit this topic and come back because every single one of these is a dissertation worth or a book length treatment uh, just to figure out as much as we can about where in the tusk a piece came from, where in the continent that animal lived, and did that piece, you know, come from somewhere based on the animal's behavior, or is it something in fact telling us about the migration of people at the end of the Pleistocene before these animals go extinct? So. Uh, we'll keep coming back to these things, but so this is just a quick overview. If you really would like to read any more or, or learn more about this stuff, shoot me an email or go to the website for www.paleotopioneer.com um, or shoot me a note there and um, I can send you or links or PDFs if you want to see some of the published version of this and that gets a little bit longer. Thanks for watching. Please tune in to Small Batch Science here at Paleo to Pioneer again.